So let's see. Um, actually, today um, we're going to talk. We're going to start talking a little bit about uh, water management. Uh, but first of all, before starting talking about water management, I'm just going to give a brief overview of um, water in California, and then what are the things that we are working related uh, to water management. So California water resources. As you have seen, this this has been a bunch of 101 lectures. First one was uh, Hydrology 101. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, California Water 101. Okay, so we have 10 hydrologic basins. Uh, what does that mean? Remember, what, what is a basin? A basin is that part of the, um, the extension, the area. If uh, if a rain, if a drop of rain falls, it will move from from whatever part of the watershed into the streams and from, from that stream out to the um, a different water body, which usually is the, um, the sea. Okay. So, um, let me see. So we have 10 hydrologic basins here. Uh, what that means is that there are 10, 10 um, well, this is how DWR distributed or uh, divided um, the territory in these 10 basins. We have uh, the Sacramento, San Joaquin, Tulare, and all of them drain into the San Francisco Bay and then out into the sea. The San Francisco Bay, the North Coast, the Central Coast, uh, South La Hontan, North La Hontan, Colorado, and the South Coast. Now, um, these are the rivers. This is the Sacramento and the Sacramento rivers. And actually, let me see. I was okay. Come on. Okay, I spend most of today. Well, a big chunk of it. Um, It is. Okay, let's start. Okay. Now we're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the um, basins in California. Anyone who uh, have problems of dizziness, just be aware. I didn't bring the bags for from enough. So it's gonna be somehow um, similar. So let's start with the North Coast. Okay. So this is the. Let's start here. So we have the Klamath Basin. So that one is just, let me see. So that is the Klamath Basin. The Klamath Basin is located in the north part of the state. Um, really, I mean, it's, it is also shared with uh, Oregon. That will be the upper basin. Um, let's go here. Ah, now we're gonna crash. Um, that is actually the climate plate. Okay. So what can you see here? Uh, okay. So the important part about this is that, as you can see, there is plenty of agriculture in these areas. So we have a lot of agriculture. Remember that I mentioned you that there is um, this basin is actually. Um, it's a basin that has, in the headwaters, the slope is very mild. And then as you're getting towards the coast, it's getting steeper. So this is this is a characteristic. In this part, as you can see, most of most of it is, is actually, um, I mean, there are not a lot of, um, there are not a lot of uh, ranges. Let's see here. Okay. Now let's go. So this is the Klamath River, and we will be heading down um, toward towards the sea. So basically, this this is going to be the Klamath River, and this is how we, it ends into the sea.
something that is interesting about this river is that here there are they have the Klamath has three tributaries. One is the uh, Shasta River. Guess what are the headwaters of the Shasta River? Yeah, Shasta. Okay, then we have here the Scott, and this is the Salmon River. So these are three parallel uh, rivers. Uh, in itself, they are actually quite different. Um, yeah, you can see here, Mount Shasta. So now, besides these three, as you can see here, there is also a large, um, large uh, agriculture in these areas. Well, not as large as the Central Valley, but we have a large um, agricultural operation. And then here, there is almost none. Um, what do you think? So considering this part of the upper climate and these agricultural areas here, what do you think would be well, some of the problems in this basin? What happens when we have agriculture? What? Go ahead. Runoff. What happens with the runoff? The dilution. The precipitation. So basically, when they return flow, some of that flow ends with salt and nutrients. And nutrients um, are provided, well, not provided, but create nutrition. That's why the lakes look green, because there is a lot of algae. Um, that's one of the main problems. What else happened um, uh, with agriculture? Besides the contamination. Land subsidence. Land subsidence. Yeah, a little bit, but it will be more than in the sun Go ahead. Erosion. In the last part, but okay. Do you think there is also some people over there? That, yeah, they need water. Yeah, so if, if agriculture needs water, do you think it will deplete water? We have, we have a problem with water depletion. Go ahead, Tom. It's high consumption in summer, low yeah. consumption. Yeah, basically, it's, it's altering the hydrology. So a lot of water needs during summer, not that much water needs in, um, in winter. So one of the problems is that it modifies the system through the reservoir and reduces water quantity. Um, then on the other part of the basin, we have, um, let me see. So this is this is the Klamath River, and here we have the other part of the of the basin, which is um, the Trinity River. And basically, the Trinity River. Well, here we have the Trinity Alps and the Trinity Reservoir. Go ahead. Okay, so it only finds the way that the, the flow is happening there. So basically, these low, these high flows during uh, spring, winter, are stored in reservoirs, and then those are moved in time to summer. That's one part. The other one is simplification. There is a lot of uh, water, um, water quality degradation. The other one is sediment, sediment transport. Uh, reservoirs stop sediment. And when they stop sediment, sediment is one of the means of fish to actually hide, of fish to provide um, enough um, good, good sediment there. So when they go on and spawn, have you seen a, uh, have you seen a video of how a salmon spawn? Basically, they just go going to the uh, river bed, flap their tail, and then they move some of the sediment to cover the rain. If there is no sediment, if there are no small um, sediment, they cannot cover the rain. And those will be washed out. Temperature. Uh -huh, right. Yeah. Well, we have, we have lakes up to, uh, but also we have a lot of hydropower. Hydropower, what the hydropower creates also, the stress, the stress the, um, um, the ecosystem. So basically, 
it's kind of like what happened what has happened let's say Saturday, Sunday, late. Basically you might be very calm like this right now and then you're gonna have a lot of money coming straight away. It is exactly the same. With that hydro peaking, what it happens is that you have very short period during fifteen hours, which might be seen 7, 8 p.m. out in the morning, when they release water through the powerhouses. So basically, they just wash out whatever is in there. And this one is, is something is something interesting. Let me see. So here we have, this is JC Boyle Reservoir. That is a diversion of a powerhouse. So basically what happened is this is where this reservoir is retaining water and it's going to be releasing water through the river and then releasing water through a canal. Once that happened, the water is moved, as you can see in parallel, this is the river and this is the canal. So basically there is water diversion, water depletion in this part. Once that had happened, when they go into this powerhouse and they just use the height to hydropower. Um, that's another way of, of altering. Um, and there are, one of the things about the Sierras is that there is enough height. So basically this, what you have seen here of pre, uh, building a reservoir, diverting the water, moving it through a canal and then just put it into um, a bunch of pen stocks, put it and fall down and then put it into turbines. That is very common. You're going to see that a lot. If, um, and that is basically what I was telling you. They just stressed out whatever is in there. It will also generate more uh, sediment movement because you have in a very short time high flow. So you just wash all the sediment. The actually right now the the Army Corps of Engineers in many reservoirs they are um, injecting sediment. Um, under the dams. They inject sediment to create habitat and then with hydro picking, all of that is washed out because what, two years later, they need to bring more sediment. Yeah, it's kind of an, an endless game. Um, okay, so this is the climate. Okay, I will have to go, let me see. So then we have other rivers in this one, and I will try to, to go a little bit faster given the short amount of time that we have. Okay, this is the Mad River. This is the Eel River. Here we have the Russian River. Um, then here we have the Pitt River, <coughs> McLeod River, and this is the Sacramento River. From the Trinity, there is a um, diversion dam here, and then they move water into Whiskey Town. When I say they, is the Bureau of Reclamation. So basically, whatever water is in here, and it's retained here, then just put it into a small reservoir, move it through a tunnel to this side, and then it goes into the Sacramento. Eventually, it will go south into the San Joaquin uh, Valley. Then here we have, we have uh, some small tributaries. Um, this is the start of the the north side of the central um, valley. Once we are here, this is the other large. Anyone who is what is the name of this reservoir? Anyone from the Chico area? This reservoir. Yeah, that's Oroville. Yeah, this is Oroville, and this is the Federal River. So this is. And something that is interesting or that I've seen, this is very uh, California characteristic. We call it some of these river forks because it has a um, fork. In this case, it has a north fork, middle fork, and south fork. Um, so this is the feather. Then in this part, we have anyone guess? Which river is this one? This is the Juba, and then it should be, oh no, yeah, this is the American. Yeah, and over here it should be, 
the Juba River. Yep. Something that is interesting is that is in, yeah, this should be the Juba. Um, when these two uh, merge, the feather and the Juba, this was the perfect point to um, build a city, isn't it? Imagine you have two rivers coming for a large amount of water. That's where you locate your city. This city is Marysville. It has been washed out since the early 1960s, 1870s. I mean, one of the main problems about this is that you have two large rivers coming. Um, okay. Which other city has the same uh, layout? Sacramento. Yeah, so uh, the Sacramento River and the American River, they just, uh, they, they have their confluence at downtown. It's again, to the right spots. Uh, consider that the people that came here, it came from from east. And actually the, the difference is that um, here we have a, a very seasonal uh, flow regime. What that means is seasonal is that during summer, uh, fall, I mean, the flows are not that high and they are actually quite low. So most of the settlements, if you consider what happened in the east, they just see the river. Rivers are usually, I mean, it rains throughout the year. So they just settle um, really around the, the rivers. Okay, and then after this, uh, we have San Francisco. Let's see, let's go to Tulare. Now let's go a little bit north. Go ahead. So the delta of the Sacramento San Pati is actually off three of the bay. So this, let me see. This is the delta, or actually the two rivers have their confluence, and once they have gone into their confluence, they are flowing through the bay. Um, so this will be um, also something important. Where is the highest point of the Sierra? Is it in the north part towards Lassen, or is it in the south part towards uh, San Joaquin, Pulare, Fresno? This is other part. Yeah, this is the highest part. Um, if any one of you have the opportunity to go uh, above Fray and Dam, which I'm assuming, where is it? Should be one of these. Yeah. Um, yeah, then we have the Madeira and Grand Canal. They, they have a lot of, oh, this is a part. I mean, this, this part is operated for hydropower. They move water from one basin to the other to do all the hydropower um, amazingly. I mean, I've, I've always get surprised how they can actually move the water from one river, they put it into a canal, they turbine that water, and then they have another one, and then during, when there is no peak hour, they just pump it up back, and then again they will do it when there is hydro peaking. So they just move around the water Extremely crazy. Um, what else? Um, okay, now we have <clears throat> uh, this part. So Carmen River, the Salinas River. This is the Monterey Bay. Um, I think this should be San Benito. Yeah. And then Pajaro River. Um, Santa Clara. I think one of these is Santa Clara, Santa Maria, Santa Ana. I'm not that well known or well versed in the southern rivers. Uh, the Colorado River. We have here uh -huh. uh, Hoover Dam. And then here in Havasu, that's when they start uh, moving water uphill towards um, Southern California, that is called the Colorado River Aqueduct. Basically moving water from that part or that end of the pipe to here. 
uh, that is that water belongs to the Metropolitan Water District. Water from here, from Mono Lake and Owens, it will go to Los Angeles into in the Los Angeles Aqueduct. So as you can see, we have plenty of fun, <laughs> plenty of things that uh, move around in the uh, in the in the state. Something that I want that I want you to take as um or, or as a take home message is that um, what you're going to see actually from your reading some of your um, assignments, you're going to see that we have since California started its uh, economic development, it also actually started its water development. Uh, have any one of you have heard about uh, hydraulic? Um, uh, hydraulic mining, mining, yeah, uh, throw a bunch of water um, to the uh, to the hills. Okay, so any questions about about this? It's really daunting, isn't it? What about the, the Central Valley project? Okay, so that is a fun one. Um, okay, so basically. The short, the short answer to that one is that basically, <clears throat> perhaps in the 1900s, um, early 1900s, uh, the, um, there was a technical development in the in the pumps. It was the diesel pumps were available and cheaper for most of the farmers. What that means is that they they could draw water, they could withdraw water from the ground. What that means is that whatever they have, I mean, they thought that they were under um, sea of water, and when I say they is pretty much this part. So, um, there was a lot of land subsidence. I mean, when I say a lot, it was a lot of land subsidence. It was about this much. So basically from 1925 to 1955 to 1975. Those were the levels of how it was happening land subsidence in the San Joaquin Tulare Basin. Well, the government said, you know, um, I think we should not continue or we should not uh, allow that this happen. So let's build a project, a plan that actually will bring water um, to this area. So exchange or incentivize farmers to, instead of them pumping water from the ground, bring in water from the north, and use that water from the north to exchange that use. Uh, how that happened, the guys who were using, so all these guys here in the west, in the west side of the valley, they were using water from, from the San Joaquin River. They had water rights, so they exchange their water rights. That's what they call exchange contractors. They exchange their water rights from the San Joaquin to the Sacramento River. The guys that were pumping here <coughs> yet too much water, um, the federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation built uh, a reservoir here to divert water south and north and exchange that water, the groundwater use, exchange it through surface water. The guys in here, in the west side, basically the federal government bill, or do we have, okay, Shasta and Trinity. These are the two reservoirs. They move water south and also to many water users in this area. It's not only the west side. They move water south, pass it through the delta, to the canals and then provide water to all this area. That's what the Central Valley project means. And they also build projects here, the one that we have in Barriesa, that's part of the Central Valley project. Um, a lot of water moving around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, we don't have about that one year of water. 
yeah for if if yeah if nothing rains if we don't have any water in october november um we still have water in the ground now the only problem is that it's very deep and some of it is contaminated um Well, some of that is actually going to meet. Okay, so most of the water, in order for people to receive water in the south and also farmers in the south, um, you need to divert one out to let water flow through the delta out into the bay. Basically, if you don't do that, all the sea water, you will have uh, water from the uh, sea coming into the delta, and then all of that will be uh, salt water that you cannot, well, you can technically move, but it's going to be very expensive to treat. That's why all that water that you're seeing there is is going into that direction. Um, it is also that water water that is taken south. Um, any other question over there, Brian? Uh -huh. Yeah. And the other the other part of, that we should think about is that um, how many of you have gone to the first part where actually I ask you to compare in that case is Pajaro value water use per capita compared to um, a general Californian water use per capita. How much water do you use a day? Do you know? How many of you know? Mm, let me see. Okay, here. How much water, according to your estimations in that exercise one, do you remember how much water is used in Pajaro Valley? 120 gallons, 120 gallons. So we are over here. San Francisco is 95. <clears throat> Where are we using our water? What's up, Lenny? This is what? Indirect use. Indirect use. Indirect use. Not necessarily wasting. The way that we use it is um, very peculiar. Uh, you're going to see in exercise number two that about half of the water is used indoors and half of the water is used outdoors. About of those 120 units of water, gallons per day, that are used in that uh, basin, half is used indoors, half is used outdoors. Most of the water that is used outdoors is through um, the lawns. The, uh, the front yards and the backyards that eventually you just kind of mow the lawn, put it in front of your, um, um, in the pavement in front of your house, and then every other week they will come and just get rid of that water that you, most most of it, we, we are spending a lot of water in terms of just having the aesthetics of our house. That uh, white big fence, uh, green yard, front yard that is that has been um, hurting us quite a lot. So that is that's it. Yeah really it is. Yeah it is. Okay. Now I have fifty minutes to run through sixty slides. But um try to do it efficiently. Okay so basically 
I know, you know, I'm, something that we should, that we should, all of us should be aware is that there is, it's not us or they, it's not agriculture versus urban, it's not industrial versus, I think all, all of us, use, use the water that you need, but not a drop more. Use the water that, that when you're um, brushing your teeth, when you're taking a shower, use the water that you need, but not a, not a drop more. This, this is what this drought is literally is teaching us. Um, we're making decisions. Okay, so in terms of physiography, basically the basin looks like, at least the Central Valley, looks like a, like a giant bathtub. So the edge of the, of the valley is the edge of the bathtub. This bathtub is filled in this part, the bottom, with a bunch of sediment which is basically what you are seeing here in the Central Valley. Um, the bathtub has an exit in the middle where actually all the water that comes here, it will flow out this way. Um, most of the water We have, when happen 90% of the precipitation, um, we have 40% of the water use. In the remaining 60% um, of the area, we have 10% of the precipitation. What have we done with that? Well, we basically move a lot of water. As we were saying, we move water through the Central Valley North, all the way South, or in this case, from the Sierras North and South, we move water west to east, and that is basically through the Macomb Aqueduct, Hechechi. Uh, you're going to find very interesting uh, readings when, when you read how um, Hechechi happened. Um, the State Water Project also moved waters from the Federal River through the Delta to the coast, going south to the coast, going south to uh, Southern California, and of course Los Angeles moved water from the east side of the Sierras all the way to Los Angeles. And that's how we have coupled with that. Some of that, moving that much water has created also, you know, it is taking us and you, all the all the taxes that you pay or that you will be paid if you live in California. Part of that actually is to finish in paying some of this infrastructure, but also to pay for the agencies and all the mitigation projects that have happened in the state of California. You are paying, I am paying, all of us are paying this. Whatever we think it was just a one payment for the capital cost to build all of this, now we're paying twice because of all the people, all the uh, treatment that we have to do, all the mitigation projects that we have to do. When people talk about the environment, yeah, it's, it is also about um, taking care of our wallets. Um, okay, let me, most of the water, about half percent of the water of the state is used for the environment, 40% for agriculture and 10% for urban. Uh, but actually this is a misleading um, graph, why? Because this is the water available, this blue column is the water available in each of the different 10 basins. As you can see, the blue, the uh, light blue, is the water that is used for the environment. The other one is for urban, and this is for agriculture. Most of the environmental use is, happens in the North Coast and in the Sacramento River. Very few in the San Joaquin, and it is almost not existing in the rest of the, of the state. So even though it's 50%, that 50% only happened between these two um, basins. Most of the urban use, happens in San Francisco and in the South Coast. Most of the agriculture happens in Sacramento, San Joaquin, Tulare, and the Colorado. Now here is a trick. Look, this is the this this column here, this blue column is how much water is available in Tulare. But they are using more water that they have available here. How do they how that happen? They take from other areas. Yeah, from all the different um, um, projects that move water north to south. That's how that happened. It is the same in San Joaquin. 
population growth. I mean, you have seen right now um, that we have a large um, growth in population. Pretty much as a rule of thumb, since 1950, we have had half million Californians every year. It's a lot of people. I mean, it is a lot of people. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure about you. I mean, I'm also an immigrant here, so I should not say that. But, but um, we are a lot of people. Yeah, we, and it, technically, we should not grow uh, linear. linearly. We should be tampered towards um, a more less linear growth. To me, that is, that is also, uh, um, I'm worried about it. Um, moving water. You're going to read a lot about this, uh, all the different eras and how um, how the again the development, the economic development uh, since Sutter's Mill and um, uh, John Marshall's discovery of the gold. Since that point, our fate, our destiny has been tied to water in California. So this this is a graph of employment. Look at at the beginning of or at the creation of the state, most of the uh, employment was related to mining. As mining well as um, the gold rush decreased and mining was um, reduced, prohibited, then agriculture start taking a lot of um, a lot of the employment. Right now. Most of it is not related with agriculture. Um, now let's talk a, bit, a little bit about um, water resources planning and management. So that's what this means, water resources planning and management. Okay, what does water resources planning and management mean? Um, okay, so we were talking about this at the beginning of the class. We don't have, we don't, okay. Basically, because water is not in the right quantity or the right quality or at the right time, when we want it for any specific societal objective, what we do is we create, this is water resources planning and management is a discipline. What does that mean, a discipline? Well, you use certain techniques, certain methods to try to match this water supply with water demand, this water supply with water quality. That's what water management uh, water resources planning and management means. Um, and basically there has been two approaches for this. The first one or the most common one is a top-down approach. What that means is that, and this used to be earlier in the 1950s, 1960s, 70s. Uh, imagine that I'm uh, the Department of Water Resources. So why not? I don't wanna get caught on, on the Department of Water Resources. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and actually you're gonna have it on your, I mean, I've already posted this presentation. It's gonna be there. But basically is water resources planning and management is a discipline that try to match when you have the water resources available, the water availability, when you need your water. And that will be in time, in location, in quality. That's what it means, water resources planning and management. Um, so there are basically two approaches. One approach when I am the authority and because um, I have a bunch of people that work in my uh, agency, I will go and tell you like, okay, new population, I'm gonna develop a plan and I will tell you how we should do, how should we operate our water uh, infrastructure. So that is a top, that is a top down approach. And basically that used to be with master plans. And uh, there is also a bottom up approach and basically what that happened is that um, you have um, a lot of these groups, stakeholder groups, when actually you define as a local uh, person, what are the things that you need? Do you need an extra water treatment plant or don't you need that? Uh, do we need to build a, 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 another well or not? So, this um, Usually, this, uh, those uh, were the typical problems about water management. So the first typical project was too much water, and that was related 
and to flood. The second one was too little, and that was related with cloud and water supply. So too little, too much, too dirty, and that was in terms of when water falling. That is, that is usually how um, typical water resource management used to look like. Maybe we have more with that one, too much ecosystem loss. Um, so those are the four problems. That's basically what we're working on right now. So these are uh, some of the pictures related with flood. And usually droughts break with flood. So I'm just saying. Um, you're going to see that the largest um, flood that happened here in California is in 19, no, 1861, 1862. Imagine the whole valley, 60 miles wide, 200 miles long. The whole central valley was flooded for two or three months, like five feet so. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's scary. People can get it. I don't know. Um, but it was, it was really, it was really bad. Yeah, San Francisco, no, San Francisco, no. Sacramento, how many of you have gone to the governor's mansion? And for governor's mansion, it's okay. Yeah. As you have seen that, that building was raised one level because basically Sacramento was flooded time and time again. Okay, so, ah, this is a little bit about the cost. The other thing that, that we have that I want for you to as a take from message is, is this part. What are atmospheric rivers? Um, I will show you a video of how they look like. So you're gonna see this is a band of a band of moisture and it can be from 60 to 70 miles. What happened is that this this is a band of moisture that brings a lot of water. When it hits the coastal range and the Sierra, it will drop some precipitation. These are two three-day events, and this is how they look. So basically, you have all these bands of moisture developing, and then this is kind of a water hose to all that water in that period, and then it goes away. That's how an atmospheric river looks like. No, 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 cancel. Yeah, that is how an atmospheric river looks like. 60% <clears throat> of the water that we have in the Sierras and in the ground and in the reservoirs come in this way. So if we have five of these events, depending on the size, we might be in a normal year. Six, eight, or nine might be in a wet year. If we have three or four, we're in a drought year. Those are our odds. Yeah, we're dependent on these guys. Um, this is actually how they look like. You can see these steps. Each of these step, like this step, this, and this, those are atmospheric rivers. Those are those are these events that bring a lot of water and they just dump that much of precipitation. And then you can see here that this graph flats out. <coughs> So there is pretty much not precipit no precipitation. And then again, we'll bring one of these events, two or three days, a lot of water, and then no rain. Um, this is this is how much water, okay, this is last year. Let me see. This is one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. This is where we are. Perhaps a little bit more with today's rain. We are here. This is how we are compared the precipitation in Sacramento compared to the last three years. And this is normal, of course. <clears throat> ah, and then four years ago, 2011, a lot of water. Yeah, we're, that is that is also the challenge in California that we have, we either have a very wet year or a very dry year, but that normal year, it never happened. And uh, this is in the San Joaquin, Again, this is where we are, and these are the last three years. Hmm, this is in Tulare. Ah, this is a good one. 
This is last year. This is this was the snow pack at the end at April 1st. And this is how it looked like one year ago. This is how it looks today. Yeah, there is no snow. <clears throat> um, yeah, as you can see, some of the reservoirs, the large reservoirs, have higher storage right now. Why does that happen? Because most of the rain that we have this year was in the form of rain, not in the form of snow. So we have less snow, not that much water uh, stored in the Sierras. Hmm. Lake Shasta. Lake Oroville. And then they're going to have apartment complex and they're going to put one on top of the other. Awesome. That was last year. Huh. These are boats, not cars. 2.2 billion. That was the the damage of of the uh, drought. 17,000 farmers laid out. The people that received the lowest, that have one of the lowest income, 17 of those were without work last year. Yeah, it hurts. Okay.